The first-person shooter genre has an amazing catalog of epic games. I was thinking to myself, what are some of the traits that make an epic FPS title? So here we are on another episode of Top 5. In this video, we'll be looking at the top 5 things that make for an epic FPS title, and I'm going to do it sharing 5 of my personal favorite FPS games. To all of my subscribers, I appreciate your engagement on the channel. If you're new to the channel, be sure to hit that subscribe button to see more amazing content on old school gaming titles. Now let's get started. This one is used in a lot of genres, but often shows up in the most epic FPS titles. During the 90s when the FPS genre was really taking off, one of the things that popped up in a lot of the best FPS games of that era was diverse level design. This is done to keep the game from getting redundant. Years later in the 2000s, a game showed up on the shelf that did this very well. The game was Time Splitters 2. The narrative of Time Splitters 2 is the perfect gateway to allow such a high level of diversity into the level design. In Time Splitters 2, the player is a time traveler and as a result, they go to some unique places. Everything from a military base in the modern era to ancient ruins hundreds of years ago to futuristic facilities. On one hand, Time Splitters creates a lot of engagement through the diverse setting of each level in the game. On the other hand, Time Splitters employs a variety of gameplay mechanics and enemy designs to further enhance the diversity of each level. These two things combined literally make every level a different experience. On the gameplay front, some levels require slow stealth, others require fast-paced action, and some land right in between. When it comes to enemy designs, some levels put the player into a monster-infested building, other times the player faces massive juggernauts, and other times the typical point-and-shoot enemy. That's just scratching the surface. This game is all over the place. It's all very diverse, and the point of it all is to keep the game from feeling redundant, because redundant becomes boring fast. FPS titles are notorious for being redundant. This is a valid issue with FPS, and there are tons of sloggy redundant FPS games out there. So how do the most epic FPS games in a genre known for doing the same thing repeatedly keep themselves from being redundant? Well, they make the levels very different from each other. So that although the player does the same thing again and again, it doesn't get boring because the variety of things they face in the game. All the changes in the pace, enemy designs, and gameplay tactics keep players on their toes, so they can't guess what will happen next, and it hooks them enough to keep playing just so they can see what comes next. This happens in a lot of genres that have very redundant gameplay mechanics, so it's not specific to FPS, but the best FPS games do this. Time Splitters 2 is a really great example of creating an epic FPS experience that hooks the player through diverse level design. Again, going back to the 90s, when the FPS genre was really taking off, one of the things FPS did to separate itself from the other action genres of the time was to try and make the players feel as if they were the character in the game. This is done to get players to feel as close to the action as possible. Years later, in the early 2000s, an FPS game came out that really took this sentiment up a notch and did a great job at making the player feel as if they actually were the protagonist and in turn creates a remarkably close to the action experience. Experience. The game was Ghost Recon. The original Ghost Recon was a tactical first-person shooter. It wasn't the first game to try and make the player feel like they were filling the shoes of the protagonist, but it did a great job at it. Ghost Recon does this in a few ways. From the narrative perspective, the dialogue uses a lot of generic personal pronouns to tell the story. For example, we're going here, or hope you did this or that. Welcome to Tbilisi, gentlemen. Hope you got some shut-eye on the flight from Bragg, because now that we're here, we got a lot of work to do. Here's the situation. We've been deployed at the request of the Georgian government to help them deal with rebels on their Russian border. The characters talk and behave as if the player was right there with them, so it creates this feel of being there with them. The next way Ghost Recon achieves this feel is through the gameplay mechanics. The game is set up so that the player is the team leader of this unit of special forces, aka Green Berets. All of the player's decisions affect the whole team. If the team succeeds, it's because the player ordered the right commands to succeed. If the team fails, it's because the player ordered the wrong commands. 
The game makes the player accountable for each person on the team, just like the team leader of a unit must do in actuality. This sense of accountability for the unit combined with the narrative drives home the sentiment of filling the shoes of the protagonist. This sense of filling the protagonist's shoes increases the intensity of the experience and brings the player closer to the action. The sole goal of FPS is to bring players as close to the action as possible and increase intensity. The first person perspective achieves this by literally bringing the player face to face with the action via the camera angle. To take things a step even further, a great way to further increase the intensity of that action is to cause the audience to feel as if the experience is happening to them. Outside of experiencing something oneself, there is nothing closer to the action than seeing something with one's own eyes through the eyes of another and to achieve the feelings in the audience one might feel in such a scenario. This is why the most epic FPS games create a sense of filling the protagonist's shoes, because it simulates seeing the experience with one's own eyes and feeling the experiences with one's own feelings. This cranks up the intensity of the action in the game as much as possible, which is exactly what FPS wants to do in the first place. It's not the same thing as being there, but it's as close as you can get. It feels epic to be in the shoes of somebody during an intense experience such as managing a special ops team or whatnot. Making that close connection to the protagonist through the execution of the narrative and gameplay mechanics mixes very well with the FPS genre in a way that can make an epic experience. The original Ghost Recon is a prime example of this. First-person plot progression is an excellent technique to further enhance a game's ability to make the audience feel like they are right there in the middle of the action themselves, exactly what FPS aims to do. Tons of FPS titles have done this. One of my personal favorites is the original Halo. Halo was one of the more cinematic FPS titles of its time. Prior to the 2000s, most of the FPS games did not have a lot of cutscenes. Most of the story was told through brief text screens, between levels, game manuals, or just through level design. Halo Combat Evolved has a lot more in-game movies than the traditional FPS from that era, but outside of the introductory cutscene, every cutscene focuses on Master Chief. The audience sees and hears every piece of information in the story of Halo at the same time Master Chief sees and hears it. When Master Chief makes it to the bridge for the first time on the Pillar of Autumn, Master Chief learns for the first time that he's going to be transporting Cortana around on some strange space ring at the very same time as the audience does. Then when they land, Master Chief learns that he needs to rescue Marines at the same time the audience does. This trend continues throughout the game. In short, the audience knows just as much about what's going on in the game as the main character they're playing as. It's like the game is feeding the audience information in real time as if the audience is actually there. As a result, it further makes the audience feel as if they are right there with the protagonist and thus even closer to the action, which is, as stated previously, the whole point of FPS. This technique combined with making the audience feel as if they're filling the protagonist's shoes go hand in hand in driving the intensity up and making the player feel as close to the action as possible. Halo Combat Evolved does a really good job at using both techniques to bring the player closer to the action. One of the most important gameplay attributes for the first-person shooter genre has always been the weapons. FPS games often advertise the cool weapons their game has. Sequels of FPS titles often advertise bringing the best old weapons forward and the cool new weapons that will be added. FPS is about the weaponry and one of the best things an FPS game can do is make each weapon useful and fun to use. One of the best games at this is the exploratory FPS, Metroid Prime. Metroid Prime makes every weapon useful, fun, and gives the player plenty of opportunity to use each attack throughout the game. It also creates space for player freedom that allows them to combine weapon reuse in a variety of ways according to their own style of play. There are many design choices that help achieve this. Some enemies have resistances, others have weaknesses, and some don't have either, or some have a combination. Enemies with a resistance force the player to experiment with different weapons they have until they find an attack that works for them. This creates player freedom because there may be a variety of weapons that work against the enemy outside of its resistance. As a result, players can choose from a variety of strategies to beat that enemy. Enemies with a weakness force the player to do the same, experiment with different weapons, but the outcome is much different. They must locate the weapon that is the go-to weapon for that enemy.
Some enemies don't have a resistance or a weakness, so it really doesn't matter what the player chooses. This enhances player choice because they can choose whichever attack they want. Some enemies have a combination of weaknesses that require the player to use a combo attack. For example, freezing an enemy and then lobbing a missile, or stunning an enemy and then rapidly bursting them down which again creates player engagement to use different weapons in a fun way. To further diversify the gameplay and engagement around weapon use, Metroid Prime uses a variety of enemy layouts to engage the player to use many weapons often. Some rooms have a variety of enemies that require the player to switch between weapons to clear the area. Some rooms have a single enemy type that requires a straightforward approach. Some rooms use a wave system that causes the player to use different weapons based on who is attacking in the current wave. There are many other layouts that lead to many different combat scenarios in this game. Metroid Prime also uses pros and cons to each weapon. Some weapons use more resources but have greater power. Others are strong but have debuffs like slow projectile speed. Others provide utility but are weaker, etc. The point of all these design choices is to make it useful to use each weapon and to engage the player in diverse and fun combat. Instead of one-dimensional gameplay that forces the player to use the go-to weapon, balanced weapon design creates room for player choice and engagement. Choice by giving players scenarios that cause players to choose the right weapon for that specific situation and scenarios that allow freedom to choose any weapon based on player style. Engagement by causing the player to think in combat versus just going to the go-to power weapon. It's also very rewarding to balance all the other aspects of the gameplay and still manage to get to the right weapon in the nick of time and defeat an enemy. Balanced weapon design makes gameplay very exciting. Metroid Prime is a really great example of this. Since the first-person shooter genre went mainstream in the 90s, a common theme of FPS titles was to cause the player to feel like they were this crazy powerful leader that can take over the universe. There is no better game to talk about this than the premier classic FPS title, Doom. When it comes down to it, any Doom game creates a sense of overcoming the universe. Even the black sheep of the series, and one of my personal favorites, turns the player into a demon-slaying tyrant. This is especially true for the new ones, but my favorite is the first Doom. Doom ties each of the attributes in this video together and puts some icing on top by causing the player to feel as if they are the Doom guy, sprinting around at 70 miles per hour, taking down demon horde after demon horde. Doom creates this sense of overcoming the universe by combining a few design choices. First, skill-based gameplay, which leads to a sense of accomplishment when the player wins. Yes, there is RNG when it comes to the hit scan shooters. That causes some luck to come into play. However, most of the hit scanners are easy to kill and can be beaten with the right strategy. So, through skill, the RNG can often be overcome. This is especially true for the original Doom, which has one of the more balanced difficulty levels in the series. Outside of the hit scanners, there isn't much luck involved in Doom. All the other enemies have a very predictable attack pattern that can be overcome through skill and game knowledge. This focus on skill and game knowledge creates a situation where players feel like they won the game, not because of luck, but because of their own demon slain skills. This leads to a sense of ownership and accomplishment when winning. The second thing is the unrelenting pace of Doom. Every room is full of action. This combination of unrelenting action and skill-based gameplay creates this sense of being this unstoppable force. It gets even more rewarding if the player takes it up a notch and plays on Nightmare, where the enemies respawn every few seconds. Beating Doom on Nightmare really does feel like overcoming the universe. Why do the most epic FPS titles do this? Again, because it brings the player close to the action and drives up intensity. Doom is a great example of each of the attributes mentioned in this video, but for me, the thing it does best is create a sense of overcoming the universe, which fits perfectly into the action focus of the FPS genre. Well, that's it for this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to hit that subscribe button to see more amazing content. Also, leave a comment. What are some of the attributes of FPS games that you enjoy? Finally, check out some of my other content by clicking on one of the videos to the right. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.